I'm reading um, Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 to 19. And when you think about it, we are hearing the words of God um, from some 3,500 years ago or so to each one of us. So it's fantastic. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us, who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face, out of the fire on the mountain. At that time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And the Lord said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey or any of your animals, <coughs> nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of it with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honour your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well for you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. Thank you, Judith, um, for, for that reading. Um, we stop there at verse 19, that's the eighth commandment, because verse 19 in particular is uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, my name is Josh, I'm one of the, the leaders here at Christchurch Liverpool, um, and if you, um, it'd be helpful to keep your Bible open on that, um, that passage that was read for us. If you'd like a, a written copy of what I'm going to say, there's one available electronically um, on our church website, which is... Um, ChristChurchLiverpool.org, but if you were to put forward slash transcript, you'll get a written copy. And there's also a, um, oh, I think the last written copy, um, paper written copy in Farsi is gone. But um, yeah, if you wanted to follow along, um, and I think there's a link on YouTube if you're watching at home to get that as well. Hopefully that'll just all help you keep up and be able to see where we're going. Um, but it's great to come to God's word. As Judith said, this is God's word to, to all of us. So let's Pray that God will help us uh, think it through in the power of his spirit now. Let's pray. Dear Father, we ask for 
you to speak to us. Uh, you've already spoken. It's been written down in your word. And we pray that as we ponder your word, your spirit would be moving to confirm your word to us, but also that we might recognize how it is you're calling us through the word you've spoken to live for you rightly today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you might not have realized, but we all have a hundred tiny daily habits that all revolve around the danger of stealing. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal, there in verse 19. That is a commandment that we all care deeply about. Uh, Let me show you. In your pocket, or in your handbag, within reach of most of you right now, there's a set of keys. Why do we have keys? You've got a key to your house or your apartment. Why? Because you're going to need it to get back in because... For some reason, you locked it when you came out. You've got a key to your bike lock, a key to your car, a key to a locker. Why do we keep so many things under lock and key? In your other hand, uh, or in, sorry, in your other pocket, or maybe even in your hand, is a mobile phone. And that mobile phone has been programmed by you to not be able to be used by somebody else unless they've got your special pin code, or your thumbprint, or your facial recognition. In your other pocket or in your wallet is a bank card and you can only use that bank card if you use that four digit pin number that only you know. You've memorized that pin number, you've memorized passwords, you've memorized the password to your email account, to your work computer, to your home computer, to your online shopping account, to your mobile banking, the pin code to your burglar alarm. In fact, you've got so many passwords to remember, you have forgotten some, and so you might even use a password manager app. I'm not even sure that, I mean, there's never been a generation, surely, uh, like ours, that have to remember so many random combinations of lowercase letters, uppercase letters, numbers, and special characters. And that's just the things you've got within your reach that are all kept under lock and key. Uh, But think about between home and here, how you got here this morning. There was a study quite a little while ago, but it's interesting, um, a study that said the average person in the UK might be seen on a CCTV camera up to 70 times per day. That is how many eyes we keep open to keep a watch on our stuff. So let's make no mistake, do not steal is a commandment that we all care deeply about. And we're all invested in making sure that that commandment sticks today. That's a commandment that we're looking at today. You shall not steal. Just those four words. Um, We've been preaching so far through the Ten Commandments. And as we've been going through the Ten Commandments, we've recognized that these are really revolutionary and kind words. That God speaks to a group of people when he makes them from a... A random family clan into a nation with laws. And as God speaks these words, he's giving them laws that point them in the direction of freedom and right living. And we can really understand that with this commandment when you realize just how many of our daily habits revolve around that threat of people not keeping this command. You start to twig, actually, this is an important command, and it's got far reaching consequences for a functioning and safe society. Now, the command, do not steal, um, I won't need to explain it too much. It's as obvious as it sounds. I think it means that God doesn't want his people to um, steal. Um, And today, we would agree that this is still a command that is good. You'd probably agree that um, we should all be really be keeping this commandment, not to steal things. We don't want our stuff going missing. And I'm guessing that most of us here today would probably think that we're doing an okay job of keeping it. Maybe there's one or two accidental misdemeanors when you walked out of a shop and forgot to pay or something like that, but we're not a group of thieves. But as always, when God gives people a word to live by, he's not just giving people some black and white rule, full stop, end of. He is giving this word so as to form people to have a heart and a mind like his. So as we take a closer look at this word this morning, you shall not steal, we're going to see that it exposes a wrong attitude that we all have deep in our hearts. 
But it is also going to point us the way to show us how God gives us grace to bring the blessing of this commandment to life in the lives of those around us. So let's jump in. First, if God wants his people's hands to stop stealing, he wants their hearts to recognize the truth that everything isn't yours. Everything isn't yours. I grew up on Lego, and I, um, as was spotted by one of the youngsters today, um, and I've come to realize that um, Lego is a, an important kind of rite of passage. Growing up making all those pirate ships and uh, police trucks is important training in childhood for when you come to adulthood and you're going to make all of that IKEA furniture. You see, you might create IKEA, quite like Lego. You open the box, you empty it all out, you lay out all those pieces, and all the pieces are there for you. Now, as you look at those pieces, you don't really know exactly what all of them are straight away. You're not too sure how they're going to be useful, but one thing you do know, you know they will be useful. Everything you see is yours. Everything you see is going to be needed for your project. You've got to make sure that everything that's there is kept, taken advantage of, and used for the thing that you are building. And this commandment not to steal, as well as just saying don't steal, it also challenges an IKEA-type mindset that I think is quite common in the world around us and maybe even there in your heart. The, the mindset that says the world is your IKEA package. So for your own sake, you know, do it for yourself, for yourself. You owe yourself this. Don't be afraid to pursue and seize whatever is out there that's going to make your life better. Some people have even made a life mantra of it. These pictures that you'd find on the internet say, everything you see is yours for the taking. Go get it. Another one says, the world is yours and everything in it. It's out there. Get on your grind. I don't know what that means. And get it. I do get that these are not saying, hey guys, let's go and steal whatever you want. But what this is saying is, don't be ashamed of having a mindset that says there's no reason why you can't view everything as an opportunity or a resource for yourself. Every friend you have, every item you could see, every experience that you might be able to get, every opportunity, every pound that you earn, gather it in. It's, it's going to be needed for your IKEA pack. You're going to need this. This is going to be something that's going to build you to be the best you you can be. You owe it to yourself. Well, the command, you shall not steal, is coming from a very, very different place. It's speaking quite counterculturally into this. And the nation who listen to this command and who obey it, they're going to start to become people who do realize that the world isn't your resource. And it's here that I think the commandment starts to be uncomfortable for us, especially if you don't think of yourself as a thief. Are there ways that we see what's within reach and want to grasp it because it will make our life better may or may not be taking what's not yours but that idea that if it's there and within reach if I can grasp it and it's good for me I've got to have it what about the time when you say on your car insurance that you park your car in the garage when you know you really park it in the road how can you make that work for you? How can we take advantage of that so that I end up with more money and they end up with less? Come on, you know, it's only the insurance company. They've got plenty of money. Or what about when you park in the pay and display bay, but you don't pay because it's only the last 30 minutes of the day. And then after that, it's free anyway. So it's not like you're like, it's hardly any difference between 5.59 and 6.01 as to whether somebody needs money for it. You're not going to get a ticket. You know you won't be caught. So it's, it's not going to be that you're a thief. But there is a situation here that you can seize. Get that for yourself. Make it better for you and it won't cost you. How about when you use the 
your work internet just to download a whole bunch of gigabytes and gigabytes of personal stuff because it's faster at work than it is at home. And that's actually quite nice because, you know, you're not really stealing it. It's not like they're going to miss it. Well, that's an opportunity that you want to seize for yourself. How about downloading cracked computer games? That is stuff that you don't need to pay for. You know that it's going to be an extortionate price otherwise, but just one click and you can get it for free. The workaround, a way that you can do it. You're not going to be caught, so it's going to be all right. Or how about when you scroll through social media during the hours that your employer is paying you to do work for them? These are all examples where you might justify taking what's not yours. You might even have a good argument that it's not really theft. You're not really taking something, or at least you're not taking something to impoverish someone else. And there's no real proper victims. I mean, maybe the council or the government or a sneaky insurance company or a filthy rich boss. But none of them are even going to notice the loss. Well, listen, even if you're right, even if that is true, do you see that those examples show that sometimes we really do put on our IKEA hats. We really do think, how can I position myself to make this situation work to my advantage, even if actually it's going to take advantage of the other person? You might not be what you'd call a thief, but that IKEA mindset is alive and well. We still need to learn that everything isn't yours. You grasp for what's within reach. Whether or not you're entitled to it, as long as no one knows. Because if you can justify it, you can take advantage of whatever may or may not be yours and use it to your advantage. Back to the command, God says, but you shall not steal. Because he's making a people and he really won't have his people believe that lie that your neighbor's stuff is your resource to turn to your advantage. He won't have his people believe that their company's office can be rightfully their resource to exploit, or that their local council services should be their resource to be able to use freely at no cost. Because God sees possession as real. And as far as he's concerned, you do have stuff, but not everything is yours. Your boss isn't yours to take advantage of just because he's rich. The people who, you, who provide goods and services are not yours to try and wangle something out of for free just so that you get the better deal and they're not even going to notice because they're rich. The bottom line is that other people are not there for your benefit. That's not, what, that's not the society God is creating. He's not creating a society where people look at others and their stuff and think, what if I could make that mine? Other people are there for you to benefit from. Everything isn't yours. But here is something that I really love about the Ten Commandments, and we keep seeing it in the Ten Commandments. It's a really, really beautiful thing. These commandments, though, aren't given by God because he wants to make life horrible for you. Because he sees you wishing that you had something more and thinks, well, no, not for you. These commandments are there because God has always, for these people he's giving them to, and for you and I, God has always planned for something better. God always wants to do something wonderful for us. The God who said, you shall not steal, didn't say that so that his people could suffer and struggle. No, he said it because he doesn't want you to pursue a life trying to position yourself to, to seize whatever you can for your advantage. He said this to people who he brought into a relationship with himself. He said this to people who he said, come in relationship with me and I own everything. And when you're with me, everything is yours. Everything is yours in God. That's actually the story of the whole Bible. The, the Bible begins with a pair of thieves. There's a man and a woman in a garden, and God said, I want to give you good things. I want to give you the gifts of everything in the garden. There's just one thing you're not entitled to. There's fruit from one tree that's not yours. But Adam and Eve put on their Ikea mentality, and they figured, hey, this whole package is mine. And if I can grasp it, and it'll work out well for me, it'll help me be awesome, 
Surely, right? I owe it to myself. It's there for the taking. And ever since Adam and Eve in the garden became the first robbers, everybody else has thought the same. And what that made was not a society of safety and security and comfort and trust, but a world full of robbery and injustice where, uh, that we see today, where people and their stuff are just treated as resources for whoever can exploit them. So God spoke these words, the Ten Commandments, and he said, you shall not steal, because he was going to make a new people whose lives would be free and fair and full, because he was going to give them everything. He was going to give them a land full of milk and honey, a land of vineyards and crops and fruit and livestock. And in this new relationship with God, that God was speaking to these people in the Ten Commandments, in this new relationship, abundance was not to be the bounty of the burglars, but the blessing of the beloved. But even then, people couldn't resist that IKEA mentality. People still thought, well, if it's within reach and good for me, I've, I've got to have it. And the story of the two thieves in the garden becomes a story of a human race of thieves. Everybody in the human race positioning themselves so they can seize what's not theirs to make their life better. But God never wanted that. He always planned for us to have something fuller and richer and better. And so God acted in history. He decided he was going to show us the beauty of what this commandment means when it says, you shall not steal. Jesus, the Son of God, though he was in very nature God, fully entitled to praise and glory, he didn't consider it that equality with God something within reach to be grabbed for his own advantage. Instead, he gave up the glory and praise of heaven to fall to a position of lowly servanthood. He didn't seize, he didn't even seize what was rightfully his. He took what was his already so that he could pour it out for others. He gave up his wealth so that we, through his poverty, might become rich and have the fullness and the safe and the mended and fixed relationship with God. And ultimately what Jesus did was he poured himself out, even his life, to death on a cross. And when he was dying there on the cross, there was next to him a thief, somebody who'd spent their life working to seize what they hoped would make their life better. Somebody who'd spent their life taking what wasn't theirs for their own gain. Somebody who'd seen everything else as a resource for themselves, and that had landed them in a painful death. But when the thief recognised Jesus, when that thief recognised who Jesus was and what he'd done, and when he committed himself to Jesus, knowing he was wrong and Jesus was right, well, all of a sudden, Jesus gave him everything. Jesus promised him there on the cross, paradise. He said, today, this is all yours. That's how it works with God. He's always held out the promise of paradise to anyone who trusts him. He says, come to me and everything is yours. Your life isn't meant to be your project of gaining an advantage using what you see to, to get an, a better deal, wrangling what's not yours, taking advantage of an employer or a loophole because you've got to seize what's going to make your life better. You can't be living like that. God has said your relationship, your life is a relationship with the God of everything who has in mind to give you fulfillment and hope and peace and identity. The stuff that you can't steal but the stuff that you're stealing is the hole is, is trying to fill the hole. God says you shall not steal because he's promised. Everything is yours. Of course, you don't need to steal. And you see it here in Jesus. Look to Jesus and see the beauty of self-giving instead of self-seizing. Look to Jesus and see that he bears the cruelty and hurt and brokenness that stealing creates. And see that he absorbs it all on the cross. But look to Jesus and see that if you belong to him, you get peace and identity and hope that is way better than anything you'd hoped to steal before. Look to Jesus and see how he places our hand in the hand of a father who says he will work everything for our good. 
Look to Jesus and hear what he says about prayer. He says, you're a child, God's a father, and you pray to him, and he's committed to give you the best. Look to Jesus and see that he says that the father won't withhold anything that we need. And see how Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to form in us love and joy and peace and patience and brings us to a place of contentment, equips us with perseverance for trials, and recognise surely there is nothing then that God has withheld that is good. Look to Jesus and believe that in him, everything you need, everything good, is yours. It's yours already. Now, whenever we see that happening in the Bible, whenever we see somebody encountering Jesus in that way, knowing the blessing he gives, knowing that he puts us in touch with the Father, at one with the Father, whenever we see people who have that security that everything is yours, those type of people encounter Jesus and they start to see their stuff differently. Those type of people look at those around them and say, actually, everything is theirs. There's a charity here in Liverpool. A number of people in our church have been involved with it and still are involved with it. It's called Safe Families for Children. And it helps families who are struggling with all kinds of different things by just providing simply a place for those children for a day or overnight. So it lets the grown-ups in that family sort out some issues and create somewhere more safe and stable. The reasons that such an outgoing giving charity was set up was well, it illustrates the change that Jesus brings about. The guy who set up this charity, which is all about giving out what you have, the guy who set it up is a chap called Dave Anderson, and this is what he said shortly after he set up the charity. He said, my dad was a bricklayer and he taught me two things. He was a man of faith, and he taught us two things, even though we didn't have any money. He said, what is ours is not ours. The things we have do not belong to us. When we're called upon periodically, we need to share what we have and hold on to what we have with an open hand. And then he taught me something about our home and our family. And he said, our family isn't for us or about us. God gave us a family for a reason. And we need to look at our home as something different. There you've got a random bricklayer in Chicago in probably the 1960s. An ordinary chap, and he met Jesus. And it's clear that in meeting Jesus, he believes that Jesus, in Jesus, everything that matters is freely given and promised. There is a man here who's the dad in this family, and he knows that in Jesus, he's got joy and fullness. He's got everything. And so Jesus changes that man from being someone who thinks that everything should be his to seize and use to his advantage. And that man is changed to believe that everything is given to him by Jesus. And so what he teaches his family is... Look out there. Look at the lost and the lonely. Everything's theirs. See that change that happens? A few weeks ago, um, Morris used the picture of a prism to show how the commandments contain so much that explode into a colourful fountain of life and blessing when we, when we put Jesus in the picture. So this commandment, you shall not see, steal, sounds basic. Great. We should stop stealing. But people who steal meet Jesus, and it's not just that they stop stealing, but because of all of who Jesus is and what he promises, people who steal meet Jesus, and they become life-giving fountains of blessing to people around them. Jesus met uh, another thief shortly before he was crucified. This man wasn't a violent thief. Uh, this one was a thief who embezzled money, and he got quite rich by doing it. His name was Zacchaeus. Um, and yet Zacchaeus didn't really get where he wanted to by stealing, because when we first meet him, he's cowering up a tree with no friends and the hated pariah of his community. And then Jesus comes to his house, and Zacchaeus learned that everything of actual value was found in Jesus. And it freed Zacchaeus of his money, and he started saying everything is theirs. So that he knew the commandment said, you shall not steal. 
And when his heart became more like the God of the commandment, Zacchaeus didn't just stop stealing, but he gave back all he'd stolen. And the law said there was a penalty to give back the same amount again, so he gave that again. And then the, the, the spectrum exploded into full colour. And he gave away double again. And then he gave half of his possessions to the poor. The God who said you shall not steal turned the tax collector's house into a food bank. In a later part of the Bible, the Holy Spirit teaches the church, anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. The commandment. But this is to people who've met Jesus, who are looking through that prism and see that this commandment now works out in a spectrum of all kinds of ways. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so that they've got something to share with people in need. If you love and trust Jesus, you get that you shall not steal isn't the ceiling the kind of noble aspiration that we're all trying to aim for. But it's the floor. We start here. God is such a good father that not only do you need to stop stealing, but you can work so that you can become like God. You can become the open-handed giver. So I'd be disappointed if you heard me earlier saying, hey, you should pay for your parking. And now in a spirit of self-righteousness, you resolve today that you're always going to pay what you should at the meter. Well, come and see what Jesus has given you. I really want you to give your heart to Jesus in repentance and faith. Let the joy of that security of being adopted into God's family sink deep into you. I want you to be filled with his spirit And then look at that car that you're now parking legally and say, gosh, I've been given this, but this is theirs. This is for someone else. I could be giving someone a lift here. Sure, I don't want you to go illegally streaming a TV series. It's not in the UK yet. That's not yours. Everything's not yours to take advantage of. You shouldn't be doing that. But I want you to more than that, to know that Jesus has forgiven you unconditionally. I want you to know that Jesus loved you before time began. And now look at that laptop that you're about to watch on and think, I wonder if there's someone who needs some company. And we could watch something legally together. It's it's theirs. Everything is theirs. I mean, you know, don't you, that you shouldn't steal credit at work for something you didn't actually do, even though the person who did it's left. They're never going to know. But instead of just stopping that, why not think about How being made in God's image and being loved by Jesus is the deepest and most profound affirmation you can ever know. And then say, I've got everything here. I've got God. I've got Jesus. He loves me. And my colleagues are finding this thing tough. So everything is theirs. So why don't I use what I have to enter into their life to spread this blessing? Everything's not yours, so stop stealing. But God always had something better in store. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? In Jesus, everything is yours. So, what do you have that's been given you? So that you can say, everything's theirs. And become that fountain of blessing to those around you.